The culture and heritage of the United States is a mix of Native Americans, immigrants, and refugees. 98% of the U.S. population traces its ancestry back to other countries. All Americans are connected to stories of cultural identity, adjustment, and integration. Over the past 15 years, some 6,000 refugees from all over the world have resettled in New Hampshire. This film is about teenagers in New Hampshire whose families were resettled here as refugees from Africa, and about their experience of cultural integration as they work to make a new life in the United States. I was born in a border of parents fleeing South Sudan to Uganda. The thing that I remember the most was spending time with people, having a gathering with family and friends and neighbors, um, eating together, chatting, telling story, playing music, and just enjoying those moments that we have with each other while it still lasted. Although we went through a whole lot, I mean, everybody lost their loved ones. And so we use those moments that we have to comfort each other, to share our story, you know, just like connect with each other. This is the house we live in, our house since we flee from South Sudan here, and that's me. <laughs> Africa is the second largest continent on Earth. It is the birthplace of humanity, and is sometimes called the mother continent. Today, there are 54 nations and over 2,000 languages. Africa is home to thousands of ethnic groups and has an amazing diversity of geography, environment, and resources. Throughout Africa, people are creative, resilient, and incredibly hardworking. Artistic expression is found in every cultural corner and has had a great influence around the world. Strong communities, musical celebrations, and cross-cultural ties are highly valued throughout Africa's many cultures. Beginning in the 1880s, European powers rushed to colonize Africa in order to control trade routes and extract the vast natural resources. They divided up the continent, creating borders and granting ruling power to some ethnic groups, pitting local states and cultures against each other. Many scholars see this era as the root of the conflict and strife that exist in parts of Africa today. We'll hear from refugees from conflicts in Burundi, Liberia, Democratic Republic of Congo, in South Sudan. Since 1997, over 2,000 African refugees have been resettled in New Hampshire. Francois Noel Sanya works with refugee families in New Hampshire to help them adjust to life in the United States. Refugees, uh, those youth, they think when they get here, they have all the opportunity to be free, live like Americans, but uh, it's not a uh, it, it's where the challenge start because you know you have to be integrated first before you can express yourself or be one of them. African teenagers who came to New Hampshire as refugees presented their experiences and stories. Four voices were chosen to tell the story of their transition to the United States. I'm Jane Yen and I'm from South Sudan. My parents are from South Sudan also too. Jane's family is a Choli an ethnic group in southern Sudan and northern Uganda that has deep traditions of oral history and telling stories, singing ballads, and resolving conflict peacefully. It's just like yesterday, I remember, the tears slide on my face as we cry. Memories flash from my Jane was born in 1995 in the middle of the Second Civil War in Sudan, a 21-year conflict over natural resources and political representation for the southern Sudanese. I just remember, like, after the war, the fight has finished, like, because the rebel, everything was burned down, and, like, so many people lost their lives that day. And so I just remember uh, my mom just crying and just looking, just, like, looking around, like, this, there's nothing here for us. We either like make it out of here or this is the life we're going to be living. Along with many other displaced people, Jane's family fled the conflict zones and traveled to Uganda 
where they lived in a refugee camp. This is one where in our interview in Kampala. In this building, we lived, there are so many families who were just waiting to get the news that they're going to America. We will walk so many miles just every day to get to the office. There will be so many people in line, and only a few of us will get to go in and share our story. Jane's family waited for two years to hear if they could be approved to resettle in the United States. We weren't really expecting that news either to come from America, that, oh, you're invited to come. Like, out of the blue, it just came, you know? Because, like, we're so, like, life was so de depressed, just, like, going around, like, we have to comfort each other. Well, my name is George, and uh, I'm from the uh, Democratic Republic of the Congo. That's where I was born, but I, I grew up in Tanzania. Uh, by the time I was born, my father was an engineer, so uh, our life was pretty, pretty good. We had a pretty big house and uh, everything. Um, we had uh, a lot of food and just about everything. Uh, but then uh, when I turned, you know, four, uh, a war broke out and then we had to flee to Tanzania. And that's when things got really bad. We lived in Tanzania for quite a while and it was just a disaster. DRC Congo is populated by nearly 250 ethnic groups, speaking 700 different languages and dialects. George's family is Lingala. Throughout the 1990s and the early 2000s, Democratic Republic of Congo and the Rwanda and Uganda governments backed rebel and military groups to fight for control of vast mineral resources. George's family fled to Tanzania. I lived in a refugee camp for a couple of years. You get the food that's not enough for, you know, to, uh, you know, to basically that you can feed yourself on uh, for a month. And you have to do something else to feed yourself so that you can live through the month. And if you don't do that, you're going to starve to death. Back in Tanzania, uh, we heard all these stories about the United States, and you know, we thought, ah, oh, well, the United States is like, you know, like heaven. You know, they're like, you know, big houses, and you know, and pools are, you know, just right next to them. Uh, but then when I actually got here, I, you know, didn't see any of that. I'm Rebecca Tarr. I'm from Liberia, from a village named Tuzan. Coming to America, they're like, oh, it's a land filled with milk and honey. You'll, you'll get money off the tree. Um, well, <laughs> if you're back in Africa and listening to this, that's a lie. You have to work like you have to work in Africa. You have to work hard to get to where you want to be. My name is Yohani Nzomara Rumwe, and I'm from Tanzania, and my parents are from Burundi. One thing, when I was coming to the United States, in the, the airport, um, I saw a white person. That was my first time seeing a white person. I was so I was scared. Like in Africa, you don't like no white people there. Like, you don't like we saw them once. Like when I was a kid, when I see a white person, I used to cry and run away. Lucretia Fields, Willard Lett and Tato Ramuabi help African and other youth address challenges and build on strengths as they strive to become successful young adults in New Hampshire. What I see with some of the youth that I work with is um, what they have at home and what they see in school or what they have in school does not really gel. So the bicultural they're getting mixed messages. So at home, parents are saying, you know, this is what's correct and this is what success looks like and this is what our expectations are. But then in school, there are different sets of expectations, different sets of um, kind of morals or different things that you have to live up to. In America here, to respect someone, when someone knows that you're giving them full respect, you look at them in the eye. Mm -hmm. But in Africa, you look someone in the eye, that is considered disrespectful. <laughs> so it's just like, I know when I first came here, the teacher was like, what's your name? Can you please look look at me? I'm like thinking, you, you want to get me in trouble? No, I'm not looking at you. So I'm like coming up. But then I, as a year go by, I see kids that talk to the teacher, looking at the teacher in the eye. I'm like, oh, I think that's what I'm supposed to do. I mean, myself. I don't like staring people in the eyes. I don't. I hate it. 
In Africa, it's like demanded and here, it's a choice you have to choose. Like, you know, a choice you make, whether to respect or not. I choose to respect because I don't want to leave the classroom and have my grade going down. Exactly. <laughs> When refugees register for school in the U.S., they are often placed in grades based roughly on their age. But some of these students have had little or no classroom schooling, and they can become overwhelmed and see catching up to their classmates as impossible. This can lead to misbehavior to hide their lack of skills. This situation is especially difficult when parents don't speak English, since they can't talk with teachers or help with homework. Yohani had very little schooling before arriving here, and has struggled to stay on the right track and catch up to his classmates. Uh, high school is getting too difficult for me. Skipping, getting into trouble. But I'm trying to work on it, like, yeah. Sometimes I go to school, I don't like, like the way the teacher's talking to me. And, and I just uh, be like, I just leave. Or sometimes, I just leave with my friends to go hang out with my other friends, yeah. Many teens hope their life in America will be one of much greater freedom, when the unspoken rules and methods of discipline are different between their home culture and what they see in school. They can lose their respect for following the rules. Us kids, like, we're trying to do like our own thing, like, because we're in the United States, but our parents, they want us to follow our, our, the way we've grown, the way we were raised. I don't think, like, think about doing homework because I don't got no homework because I skipped school. And yeah, and that, that lasts me. That lasts me more time to hang out with my friends. At their home in Manchester, Johanny and his parents, Gabrielle and Margarita Nyandwi, discussed their transition to the United States. Gabriel was raised on his family's farm in Burundi. In the 1990s, he managed the farm, which employed members of the extended family and seven other people. They grew coffee, bananas, and many different vegetables and sold the produce both at the farm and in local markets. Before Yohani was born, his family fled Burundi near the beginning of that country's civil war, which lasted from 1993 to 2005. My mom and my sister and my brothers they were running they they were just one day they were in the house having a great day and they just they just hear guns shooting up people running they're like you gotta run you gotta do that people are coming and my parents pack up the stuff and they moved to Tanzania. Yohani was born in a refugee camp in Tanzania in 1997. He lived there until the family was resettled in Manchester New Hampshire in 2006. Here in New Hampshire, Yohani's mother, Margarita, participates in a market farmer program based in Manchester, continuing the family's farming tradition. Gabrielle and Margarita discuss the differences in discipline strategies between the U.S. and Burundi. Their native language, Kirundi, required two interpreters, one from Kirundi to Swahili, and another, Lucretia Fields, from Swahili to English. Yohani was at home on a school day, suspended for skipping classes and fighting at school. From where they come from, uh, kids in school are responsibility to the teachers. So if anything happens in school, they expect the teacher, they talk to him and the teacher, and they expect the teachers to solve those differences from school. In schools, for example, when the other kids go home, he will be left behind to either do farming, so he'll be digging somewhere, so that is one of the punishments. But here they don't have any other alternatives. Yohani has spent time in court-ordered placement facilities in New Hampshire. These kids are put in placements. They are fed very well. They are given everything they need. To them, that is just like a holiday. But if it happened in Africa, they can only eat what they actually plant. So if they don't do the work, then they don't eat. If somebody you're given everything that you need, then what is the need of you not wanting to go back to the same place again? 
Most of the time, if he's not at home or he doesn't come home, they'll have to call the police to go bring him back. So most of the time, he's somewhere else. Uh, apart from where the father would expect him to actually be. So at this age already they can do very little. So those, those are some of the challenges specifically for him as a father. Parents, uh, when they get here, they don't have the tool to, to navigate the system. You know, they have to learn English, um, get a job, pay the bill. Like my dad. Like he has to come like to a friend, like a family friend, to help him to like to read the mail. Like if my dad like no English, he would do it that himself. Yeah, but it's difficult because he doesn't know English and my mom doesn't know English, and it's hard for them to get a job because they don't speak the language. The youth become acculturated, become familiar with all the, the cultural expectations quicker than the uh, adults. And it's not unique to uh, African, people of African descent, or uh, immigrants or refugees, because we as adults, you know, we, when we have children, our children are coming along, they're getting into with the latest thing, and we're still living in the old country of our youth. We're young, we adapt to it much quicker than they do. And so they think that we are becoming American, forgetting our own culture, mm -hmm. in which we're not doing that, we're not trying to, we're not being disobedient. We're respecting them, but also respect this culture by learning more. Because the more you learn, the quicker you start to understand things and fit in with other, like the society. Most of the adjusting of the youth affects everybody else in the families. So when they are better than their parents in probably just a language, then they either become translators for their parents and when they become translators for the parents, as a youth, again, I think Bullet said it perfectly fine, all youth are the same when it comes to growing up. Uh, there's so much that changes as they grow up. Mm -hmm. So what do you expect when a youth of a certain age believes they are better than their parents just because of having mm -hmm. the language factor better than mm -hmm. their parents? A lot of you know, uh, African kids who, um, I don't know, uh, for some reason, when they start speaking English, they don't want to speak their native language. They don't want to talk to their parents anymore. They don't want to do, you know, they don't want to be told what to do by their parents. They just change dramatically. Sometimes it's really hard also on the kids mm -hmm. because they're doing all they can do. But then it's just like they're also playing a part as like the parent role also too. It's like. You're like teaching them instead of them, like they teach you a certain culture and you're teaching them this new culture you're learning. He takes me to all my appointments, t like tell me not to skip. Like he's doing his job, but sometimes I'm not doing my job. It's my job to teach him English. But sometimes I don't because I just come in the house and just go to my friend's house. That makes me like, I feel like I'm not doing my job. Sometimes I get a little stressed because I have to um, sometimes miss some of my school like time to take my grandmother to the hospital and translate for her. I don't mind doing that, but it's also taking away time from my, from my education and everything. But I really don't mind. Today, Rebecca interprets for her grandmother, but it was her grandmother's wits and resourcefulness that protected Rebecca and her siblings in Africa. My grandmother actually rescued me from the war. If it, um, if it wasn't for her, I would have been killed in the war. War, from the beginning, war came on me. My man was deaf in the war. Um, our grandfather was killed in, during the war, so it was just her. She had to take care of all the kids by herself. And back then, it was really hard for like a woman to like do everything by herself. But she like stuck it through and like provided for us until we came here. Rebecca was born in Liberia in 1995. More than 16 cultural groups live in Liberia, speaking over 30 languages. Rebecca's family is Kron. When she was seven, during the Second Liberian Civil War, her grandmother took Rebecca and her siblings out of Liberia to safety in a refugee camp in Ivory Coast. My grandmother had to go like to the, uh, selling fish every morning. She'll get up like four in the morning 
and like walk from here all the way like to almost two hours two hours walking just to provide for us and I f it's like really hard when people like say it say like oh go back to your country it's like you're insulting me you're telling me to go back to suffering why should I go back to suffering when I can have a life here for two years they lived in the refugee camp waiting to be approved as refugees this process involves extensive investigation and interviews, but later affords permanent legal status in the resettlement country. Rebecca's family arrived in Concord in 2004 when Rebecca was nine years old. The language was de very different from ours, so we didn't fit in that much when we got here, but we tried to fit in with everybody. Before we came here, we usually uh, always with our grandmother. We're always with our grandmother, so it was kind of used to me. So I was, I was, it, was, it was something different, like to leave my grandmother and go like to school. I never been apple picking before, like in my life. But when I came like to America, one of the teachers, Miss Olson, took us apple picking, and I loved it. She like took us. A lot of places show us around Concord and like show us to different places that we'd never been before in Concord. And like it got us used to Concord and, and more comfortable with the place. <laughs> she said what worry her about us being like in America is that she doesn't want us to end up in the street, like go off the wrong way and following bad influence. Because if that happens, she don't know who she can go to to help us come out of that stage. So she always advises us to like remember why we're here and like to focus on education and to not follow bad friends and like be influenced in bad stuff. I strive for like success in life just to make her proud and to take care of her in the future. I wish I could cry, I wish I could let it out, but the tears inside me running dry. I wish I could cry, I wish I could let it out, but the tears inside me was just running dry. When you go to school, uh, that uh, kids, youth, they don't have the same treatment than their peer who are uh, native or Americans. They think that just because we're from Africa, we don't understand that we're stupid. So it's just like, mm -hmm. I'm not, I'm a normal human being just like you. Just if you get to take the time to learn about me, you'll actually understand that there's something that you can also take from this also. If you learn how to share and collaborate and compromise together, there's a lot that we can all change, you know? We could change our society and like welcome new Americans when they come so they don't feel like, oh, I don't belong here just because. They tell, they tell me that I should go back to my country because of what happened back in the past or just because whenever a teacher tried to assign us to a group, no one wanted to like, be in a group with me. It's just, that really hurts, especially the new Americans. Like, they, like, it's hard for them to contribute to the class or even raise, bother raising their hand up to ask any question. When I came, I was really like, al really like alone because people were like, I don't, I think they were like shy or scared to like come and interact or ask me like, what's going on? Like, how are you doing? Are you new here? And all that, but now it's better because when you're new, I guess we're taught in the school now to like, inter like in to get involved to with new people because like you get to learn more about them and their culture is different than here so you get to learn something new about another person's culture than yours. The major challenge that uh, African youth, I think, uh, face that is unique to African youth is the challenge faced by African people, which is racism. I have an example of a girl who comes into an after school and we say tomorrow we're going to have this beautiful, wonderful party and the first question that comes out from her mouth is, are we going to have normal people? And no more people. Yes. And my normal. question uh, was, who are the normal people? Uh, at first she was shy to say it and then finally she said, the white people are normal people. 
in other words, this is also from the house. From everywhere she goes, she's been conditioned to believe that because she's a black young lady or a black a uh, person in general, she's not a normal person. A kid on the bus was kind of throwing raci like racist word at us going, oh look at those, you know, black monkey. And obviously, I'm not a monkey as you can see. I'm a normal human being, the only difference is I'm darker and you're lighter. That's the only difference. I got blood in my vein, you got blood, we are the same. But you say, oh, black girl or you black monkey go back to your country go back to the forest I didn't live in the forest by the way <laughs> I don't swing on trees like Tarzan that's like oh Tarzan wife look at you you're black okay what's wrong with me being black I'm proud that I'm black the only difference is I'm dark and you're lighter than me that's it some kid in my school I'm not gonna say no name uh, he said I was I'm a I'm a dirty African and in my heart that like that hurt me like I was angry. The most uncomfortable thing I ever experienced is like sometime in history class when we're watching slave oh. movies. Oh my it's gosh. when they make like you hear people like mimic like mimicking to themselves whispering, Oh, did you see that black person? I wish you did this, like oh look at that. Laughing about it. It's just like I'm right here, I'm not stupid, I can hear you. Mm -hmm. And so we're here, we're trying to get education by them to telling us, you don't belong here, you're not supposed to be here because you're black. And it just like, some of us wonder, like, well, what that's supposed to mean? But then when I watch the slavery movie, it just made it like, that happened here? As I'm actually like surprised when like, I first came here, I didn't know nothing. Mm -hmm. And just then finally I see like this movie, I'm just like, yeah. why is that happening? I didn't understand. <laughs> and when I finally understood that, I have to admit that I was angry at first. I'm like, no, I don't want to make friends with them because that what happened back then. But then I start to learn that you cannot judge people to say that by the book of the cover. You have to learn them. Noel Sonia and Lucretia Fields work at an after-school program in Manchester for African youth. Adults who do this work can play an important role in helping newcomer youth understand and process some of what they have been through. In most of our kids, for example, we realized at some point we needed to introduce something that would let them open up. We told them to draw a family tree. And we just wanted to just figure out if everybody understood, you know, mm -hmm. who your family was. You know, we have ages three mm -hmm. to 14. And they all drew everything that you can think of. But then we had some of these kids who drew things like people's heads slashed, for example. We were able to actually understand what that kid was going through. So with the fact that they've passed through so much, it has helped them also become a shaped who they are. Like we were watching the War War um, one movie and I was just like, started crying because I was thinking like the Liberian war that went on because I was looking at the little boy that was in the, like, how did he lost his father? I lost my grandfather, my um, my cousins, a lot of people in, during the war, and um, I was just sitting down and crying. My teacher was like, "Okay," she thought I was upset, be upset because of the movie, and um, I just explained to her that looking at war movies reminds me of the war that happened in my country and how I lost a lot of people because because of something so dumb they want the land so they're gonna fight us because of that so they're gonna kill our people because of that so I was just like a lot of people were not shot they were literally butchered right in front of you and you have to watch it and you get nightmares every day because of that and uh, yeah uh, that stuff We recently we did um, the um, I am poem so you say like I am from this you remember like your favorite memory you remember your favorite food so you write down those things and then people start to express themselves and one of the young people actually said I am from my scar so then when they started talking about it they um, told us a beautiful story about how they fell when they were, they were like maybe 
three years old and then that's how the young woman got a big scar on the forehead but then that scar is now the source of strength that like I survived this and that's why I am the scar. In most of Africa, extended families live together and have close kinship ties. When they become refugees, the smaller nuclear family is usually separated from their extended family and larger community. The terror and displacement of war and the resettlement process can leave them feeling vulnerable without the supports they are used to. The idea in America that like your own family or your parents are the only people who can help you and should be the only people who help you is, is difficult. I don't know any society where your parents can do it all and then you'll be fine. We need other people to, to build you and um, help you and mold you. Uh, we have to figure out what are the, the thing that they like, be it cultural, be it uh, uh, foreign. It, it really doesn't matter. What do they like? I know our after school program had to ask all of them what they liked and they came up with something like drumming. So we had to figure out how to get drumming and why they needed drumming. We figured out out of 55 kids, at least 25 of them really loved drumming because where they came from, they always had drums. And that eventually most of them learned how to drum. So by bringing that social kind of life to them has made it easier for them to relax. It has also made it easier for our teachers to actually help them heal. In, you know, with all the things that are going on, there is that free time where you can actually do something that you like. We have like 10 people in the family. Now 12, 13, I don't know, because, you know, we got nieces and, 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 and I don't know, nephews. Several generations of George's family have been able to prioritize higher education. George's older brother, Prince, works in the community here in New Hampshire to help teens stay focused on their schooling. When you go to school, after education, you'll be different because education is the foundation of the life as we know. You know, when you want to start your life, so you have to start with your education. It's pretty important for everybody. And the guy over there, that's my brother, my little bro. He's 23, he graduated from uh, high school, but right now he's going to college. He's doing uh, computer engineering. Yeah, that's my sister, uh, Sharon, and she just graduated from uh, Seacoast Career School. That's the entire family. I mean, mom, dad, you know, and eight kids plus and then two, uh, two guys, the, ne the nephews and one niece, and the uncle. My uncle, the one who came from Africa, uh, he's a doctor. He came for a visit. It's uh, in Angola. Angola, it's in Africa. It's close to uh, Congo. American people also need to know that we came from Africa, so we have also African cultures, which is good, you know. The way you dress up, the way you talk, you know, the way you behave, you know, in the community. You know, it has to show that this guy, he came from Africa. We were born speaking French. And then when we uh, left the Congo for Tanzania, we started speaking Swahili. And uh, so we like got a mixture of French and Swahili. Sometimes we would speak French and then Swahili and stuff like that. And now we have uh, another new, you know, brand new language, which is English. Uh, I call him Englishman because he's now perfect in English better than me. You know? I started learning English, but right now he's the best. I came to the U.S. about four years ago, in 2010. I'll graduate in college and, you know, four years from now, and probably be a mechanical engineer after that. I actually got the influence from my, my dad because it, he's an engineer himself. Um, so he always told me to do, uh, you know, to get into engineering. And so I decided to do that. My dream is to go to the Marines. Oh, like, I always want to go from, like, Marine, yeah. It's a program they have that helps you go there, like, RTC. Yeah, I'm, like, I'm trying to, like, I'm going to try to do, like, trying to do that. Yep. Yeah. And after, I'm, like, I'm going to go to the Marines, 
and then after after Marines, I'm gonna I'm go to college because they pay for your college four years. I want to be a singer and a doctor as well. Yeah, because my grandfather was a doctor, so I want to follow that line. And I like helping people out as well. But mainly, I love to sing. That's my passion. When I'm singing, I really don't think about my surroundings or what anybody thinks of me. It's just like a place that I go to escape like this world. It's a place I can go to be free, to be myself. Yeah, to express who I am. So many pains in every day. I'm just trying to strive for that one good day. Don't want to be like everybody else. Want to be like my own person. Want to strive for the better and never for the worse. Yeah, yeah. Jane and her family have made connections locally to other Acholi people from their homeland of South Sudan. We don't really do a lot here in Concord because there's not a lot of Acholi family. So there's only like only us, basically one. And my cousins, which live just over there. Um, now mostly in like Maine and Manchester, there's a lot there because most of them moved there. Um, we do a lot of dancing. The South Sudanese reunion where we celebrate with each other, we tell stories. Um, the parents will like give a speech like to tell the kids, no, um, this is your dream, just to basically motivate them to go on, that we are here, this is possible because of you guys. This group of South Sudanese girls performed at the International Women's Day celebration in Manchester. Each region of Africa has a unique cultural mix languages, traditions, musical performances, and more. Regions are diverse, but are linked by shared values, including hospitality, friendliness, and an emphasis on the joys and strengths of community. Connecting with other immigrants and retaining unique cultural practices are parts of building an identity in New Hampshire. The stories of Africans and Americans have been intertwined for centuries. Each story about coming to America and becoming American carries its own important details. As Jane says, we learn about ourselves by listening to others, and we should never judge a book by its cover, for to do so is to miss incredible stories about all people, including ourselves. Seeing my mom, she didn't go to school, and just said she struggled. And I don't want her to struggle, I don't want my kids to struggle the same as my parents did. And I want to like change that history. I want to be, like, become a dream, something they always talked about, but make it a reality this time. By going to college and becoming successful. <laughs> like the things that motivate me the most is the experiences that I had back home. I look back, I'm just like, those, some of those people who died, who never got the opportunity. I, I know I'm not that strong in a way, but like with everyone coming together, they make me strong. We asked Johani if he felt it was a good idea to take the long journey from Africa to America. It's good. What does your ask your dad? I hate speaking my language. Language. Oh, the Indian have just acquired Kadumla America. Oh yeah. Who am I going to be? I ask myself every day, Jane, look at the mirror. When you look at the mirror, who do you see? What woman, like what type of woman are you? Are you strong? Do you have courage that whatever come in your, in your way, your path, that you're going to make it through? Are you going to fall? And if you do, are you going to get up? Jane has been applying to colleges and talked about an email she received from one of the schools. I was, uh, I remember that when I came in uh, my room, like from after school, I just look at that email, I'm just like, hmm. 
I bet it's saying them joke letter again. <laughs> so I'm not looking at it. No way. <laughs> it could be very depressing. No way. I'm not looking at it. But in my mind, it's just like, Jay, open it. No matter. Because, like, if, if this regret, like, rejected you, ah, that's not you. So nervous. I'm like, this is my life. You know what I mean? Because, like, all I worked so hard for is to get somewhere, to go, to go to a college to do something. It's just like, oh, okay. So finally, I opened the mail, and then the, I read it. It's like, congratulations, you got, you have been accepted. I'm just like, I can't. That's a joke. That's joking. I, I don't believe that. And I read it again. I'm like, what? I got accepted. I, I, I was speechless. I literally, I like start tearing, and I'm just like, I made it. You know, someone heard my voice, and someone listened. I said, Mama, can you see my tears? I'm singing from my heart to you. God, can't you help me believe? Send an angel here to me. I'm so tired of being down. I wish I could let it out. I'm so tired of being who you say I am. I just want to be free, be just like you equally. I'm not different, because my skin is different. Why do my skin speak louder than my words? Why do you listen to a different thing than who I am? Just let me be me. I wish I could cry, I wish I could let it out, but a tear inside me is running dry, I wish I could cry, I wish I could let it out.